Welcome to Tribe TV with me, Jared Cooper. The Tribe is our online global learning community. Um, but we're doing some kind of extra free stuff with the studio that we've got built for that uh, to encourage everybody. Every single night we're on at eight o'clock, just bringing you some teachings, some interviews, some encouragement to keep faith and keep hope high in this time. At the moment we're on, I think it's day four of a conference I did in Johannesburg all about revival. I actually believe revival is very linked to what is going on around the world right now. We might just find that God is actually going to do something extraordinary out of this unusual time. Um, before we get to that, let me tell you about an app. Uh, yesterday, last night, I told you uh, about the Version 30 Day Shred, which is a way to get through loads of the Bible, all of the Bible in 30 days. You can take a bit longer if you want, but to get tons of the Bible, tons of scripture into you. I think in the description it talks about this is, this is not looking at leaves this is looking at trees or forests in other words it's the big picture taking in of the bible i want to tell you about an app that's completely the other way around it's about taking in little portions of the bible and chewing on them deeply which is another powerful way to get the word of god into you this app is called the daily light on the daily path and it's in your app store and it does little readings and this was this morning's let me read you this morning's uh, it's just a series of scriptures sewn together from across the bible to give you inspiration you can just chew on them really slowly and enjoy them listen to this one it says this be strong and brave. That's Joshua 1.18. Then it goes on. The Lord delivers and vindicates me. I fear no one. The Lord protects my life. I am afraid of no one. He gives strength to those who are tired, to the ones who lack power. He gives renewed energy. Even youths get tired and weary. Even strong young men clumsily stumble. But those who wait for the Lord's help find renewed strength. They rise up as if they had eagle's wings. They run without growing weary. They walk without getting tired. My flesh and my heart may grow weak, but God always protects my heart and gives me stability. It is God who is for us. Who can be against us? The Lord is on my side. I am not afraid. What can people do to me? By your power, we will drive back our enemies. By your strength, we will trample down our foes. We have complete victory through him who loves us. Get up and begin the work. May the Lord be with you. And it gives you all the references of all of those scriptures at the bottom. It's a beautiful little app. If you just got 10 minutes, or as long as I just took there, but if you're going to meditate on them longer, just you can sit with a daily light on the daily path and just chew over scriptures and let the word of God dwell in you richly in this time. So I highly recommend that when I use it all the time, if I've just got a moment to sit down and I want to meditate on scriptures for a moment. So there you go. We are going to head over to a conference in Johannesburg. I am talking about revival. And at this particular moment, I'm going to begin to talk about the Great Commission, but I'm going to preach about the Great Commission in a way that you've never heard before, I would think. I'm going to talk about how the Great Commission is a culture that we're meant to build in our lives and in the church. And I hope that it stirs you to grow in the things of God and to build your life and build your church and your team in the way that it should be according to, to scripture. And at the very, very end, if you want to stick around, I'll tell you about the tribe if you want to know about our online learning community. Let's get to Johannesburg and let's hear the word of God. Yes, yesterday, this whole concept of stewarding revival really is the passion of my heart. Do you know in life, that there's two sides. There's, there's, there's wine and wineskin. There's breath and bones, right? Wine and wineskin. A, a, a lot of us love the wine and find it easy to teach about the wine, infuse about the wine, enjoy the wine, drink the wine, spread the wine, anoint with the wine. Whatever, I know I'm going everywhere now, but, you, you know, very whiny. Um, but if you don't have a wineskin, you'll lose the wine. And actually, Jesus is very clear. Both are important. It's important that you don't lose either of them. And so if you don't address the wineskin issue, you won't preserve the wine. I don't care how prophetic you are. If you don't deal with issues of structure and behavior and interaction and culture... Uh, you will lose the wine that you had. And it's the same if you go to Ezekiel 37. You've got the breath and the bones. Okay, without bones, you might be alive, but you're still just a jelly on the floor. Okay, I don't care how many goosebumps you got on that skin. You need some bones to stand up and make a difference, okay? And so there is a structure that revival requires. It's not just breath. 
It's not just to be revived. It's to be revived and sustained and carry that into our world of work and parenting and changing nations and speaking to governments and media. And that requires some very powerful thinking around things like culture. There's a saying in kind of uh, uh, leadership health circles. Have you heard it before? Culture eats vision for breakfast. In other words, it doesn't matter how many slogans you've got on the wall, how we interact and behave with each other every day, what fills our diaries, what we say yes to and what we say no to will actually define us more than our vision. Who's ever had a longing to do something really great, but you keep getting distracted by the really urgent? Who, who ever gets distracted by the things they can do instead of the things they should do? That's all culture. That's stewarding revival. And the Bible speaks as much about culture, as much about wineskin, as much about bones as it does about breath and wine. And so my heart is, uh, my passion in our church in England is to, and we've got very big L plates on. Would you call them L plates when you're a learner driver? Okay, be a lifelong learner. I mean, you're only going to arrive when you die. And then when you die, you'll realize, okay, now I'm just starting. Because when you've been there about a million years, you'll start to say, okay, I think I'm just about beginning to understand the tr of Trinity, okay? <laughs> Culture's huge in our churches, and our lives, our teams, our departments, our projects, our workplaces, our homes are full of culture. And here's the thing, we must choose culture or it will choose us. The wisdom of stewarding a move of God is required to cause a move of God to be sustained and for us to be healthy in the middle of it. So I was kind of talking about this yesterday morning. What I want to do today is a little bit of a leadership talk. Is that okay? But work with me. I'm addressing the whole church as leaders because you are a leading church. Every single one of you in this room, even if I went into the Sunday school right now, I would see leadership all over you. So turn to the person next to you and say, you're a leader. Now tell them, get over it. You have influence. You are important. Your decisions matter. How you spend money matters. How you parent your kids matters. The things you say yes to and no to matter. They're your chosen culture and they will define your life more than the prophecies. Because you will live culture. And sometimes people live culture till they die, but never pull their prophecies and build them into culture. They think if we just declare them, that's enough. It isn't. You've got to fight with them. Prophecies aren't for putting on a shelf and seeing if they happen, are they? They're for fighting with. Timothy, take those prophetic words and you wage war with them. In other words, you've got to make them happen in 9 to 5, Monday to Friday, real life. And those are wisdom decisions every time. The church is not a river. It is a city with a river running through it. We've got to learn how to live on the banks of the river of God's power and presence and how to live in a sustained and powerful way and carry God into our world. Amen? And so that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about church culture. But this is, it's church culture. If you're in a team in this church, this will speak into your team culture. Every single team in this church, whatever you, I, even if you clean the bins every week and that's your job, you need this culture. You need this culture in your home. You need this culture I'm going to speak about in your own personal life. This culture addresses everything. There are some big, true north truths. And if we grasp these and build these into our lives, it's not, it's not purpose. It's how we fulfill purpose. God just doesn't give us an end. He gives us a means he said very clearly, this is how I want you to do it. And lots of Christians get lost along the way. I shared yesterday from Luke 9, following Jesus is hard, and we can get deceived along the way. Things happen that hurt our hearts, right? 
My great, great uncle was uh, uh, in England, a famous explorer, Sir Francis Chichester. He was a sailor. He was a pilot. If you look on YouTube, you'll find the old Pathé News. Remember Pathé News? You'll find a film of him being knighted by the queen and all this kind of stuff. And he, he flew uh, planes in the days when you could just buy a plane and start flying and see how you go. Do you know what I mean? It was a little old Bible. He crashed so many times. Uh, he he kind of, he flew like I lead church. <laughs> by, by the seat of his pants, right? Experimenting, that's right. And then he became a sailor, and he was one of the first sailors to solo circumnavigate around the world. And he came up with a lot of navigation systems that we enjoy today and use today. And, uh, but he was, he was sailing across the Atlantic for three weeks until he realized that the biscuit tin next to his compass was magnetic. What he thought was true north was not true north. Because something was lodged next to his direction compass. Now, when you're off for it for a day or an hour, it doesn't matter too much. But three weeks later, he was miles and miles and miles off course. Anybody here lived a bit? I've been going to church 48 years, been since I was 10 days old. Used to go to five services every Sunday. I've been to thousands of church services. Some of you look like you've been to <laughs> thousands, you know, and we live this Christian life, but who knows that stuff can get lodged next to your heart, and you don't even know you're going off course because you're keeping going with the churchy Christian stuff we do, but is anyone asking the question, is that true north? You know, the time we meet, when we meet, what we do, how we pray, how long we go. They're all culture things. They're not divine. Every now and then, God will give you a time and a place. But most of the time, it's just church culture. I want to speak about some big, true north truths that we need in our lives. And I want to speak out of the Great Commission. But it might be the Great Commission like you've never heard before. Because this is the Great Commission for leaders. Because when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he didn't just tell evangelists what to do. I believe he told us how to build church. And it's in the Great Commission. And this isn't just for teens. This is for every individual. And so really, I'm going to ask you, because some of you will go, uh, for, 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 for probably more than half the room, I'm going to be preaching to the choir. You're going to go, woohoo, yep, that's me, I live that. And there's the other half where really I'm asking, are you really living what Jesus has asked you to live? Or are you a cultural Christian? We're going to look at some true north truths. Is that okay? So come on, let's read the Great Commission. And uh, Matthew 28 and Mark 16, we're going to read both versions. And then we're going to just go into some stuff from it. And then when I finish preaching for four hours, we're going to lay hands on everything. I'm going to thank you, both of you. We're going to lay hands on everything that moves. Praise the Lord. No, don't worry. I want lunch as well. There's more feasting than fasting in the Bible, right? <laughs> Matthew 28, verse 18. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Have you read the Gospels lately? <laughs> Teach them everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And then Mark 16, at the end of Mark, from verse 15, very, very similar, but a few additions. Jesus said to them, go into all the world and preach the Gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs, everybody say signs. These signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they'll drive out demons. They'll speak in new tongues. They'll pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They'll place their hands on sick people, and they'll get well. I love this. This is what the master said to us that we're supposed to do. Every single one of us in this room. Let's pick out four things from these passages that we're supposed to be doing. Let's just start with the fun one. I'm not going to labor this because you guys live this. 
the result of living the Great Commission the right way are that there will be signs in the church. Notice it's not signs for preachers. It's signs for everyone who believes. In other words, the culture of the church left behind where disciples have been is that miraculous and supernatural things will take place. There will be a sense of God. There will be healings. There will be deliverances. That also talks about spiritual warfare in the heavenlies. There will be authority on the church to change atmospheres and bring heaven to earth. That's the whole point of this story, is it not? One of our churches is in quite a rough area for England. Okay, so you still, you know, every now and then someone will shoot at the building while people are praising and worshiping. So it's a, a little bit rough, but you guys are probably looking at me going, you don't know what you're on about. But anyway, work with me. It's pretty rough for England. Relative, absolutely. We drink tea in between the shots. You know, <laughs> eat our cucumber sandwiches and just, oh, it's only shooting, don't worry. One of our lads went out onto the local estate and he saw a group of 15-year-olds and he went up and he said, can I tell you about Jesus? And they turned around and said something ending in off that wasn't Greek or Hebrew. <laughs> and he tried a couple of times, but they weren't interested. Then one of the lads was kind of leaning back on a bicycle with an obviously something wrong with his leg. He said, if, if God heals your leg, can I tell you all about Jesus? And before they could respond, he slapped his hand on their shoulder, uh, on the lad's shoulder, and prayed, Jesus, please heal this young man. He leapt off his bike and started shaking his leg and grabbing his tummy. And he said, what's that? And he began to shake under the power of the Holy Spirit on the street. And he's there shaking. He says, I can feel this peace moving through my body. The amount of people that say that is incredible. I love the presence of God, right? They said, what is it? They said, oh, that's just God. That's the presence of God saying hello to you. But how's your leg? My leg's better. And then he stands there, never been to church in his life, 15-year-old, stands shaking like some of us are going to do this morning. And he stands there shaking, right? So then the other 15-year-old said, what's going on? And he goes, I think it's the power of God. And it's like this. So they go, can we have some? So in the middle of the street, they line up, put their hands out like every Christian would do. Never been to church, but put their hands out. And then began to shake under the power of God on the street. A little group of seven, eight, nine-year-olds walk up. What's going on? The one on the end goes, it's the power of God. <laughs> Seven, eight, nine-year-olds, can we have some? They line up, get prayed for, begin to shake under the power of God. A policeman walks up. What's going on here? One of our lads, is it the power of God? Do you want some? No, I've got a job to do. He disappeared. <laughs> that night, 20 of those lads came to the church and gave their lives to Jesus. I love that when the Apostle Paul was tidying up the church, the Corinthian church, he still said non-believers should come in and fall on their face among you saying, God is in this place. That to the Apostle Paul was tidy church. Okay, Acts cha that's decently in an order. Acts chapter 2, they were perplexed. They were amazed. They were utterly amazed. They were confused. They made fun of them. And I go, yep, 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 yep. They're all the culture of heaven. Let's have it. Yeah. We want God among us. Amen? But you guys know all that. I don't need to teach you that. The result of us doing this Christian life right is it will be the marks of heaven among us. But let's look at three of the things that we do to sustain that. And this, I want you to think, I want you to think in a way you've never thought before. I want you to think about behaviors and diaries and how you live your life and how you design a department in a church or a project or a ministry, how you design an entire church. Let's do three of the really big key words. I wish I had more time. We could do more words, but let's do the three from this passage. We could do that, couldn't we? Come here. Come on, iPad. Are you going to work? Hallelujah. No technology in heaven. You've still got your headset on. You're so, are you doing a call center while you're having a break now? You know, hello, welcome to ACF. How can I help you this morning? At least you're not in the toilet like yesterday, right? So we were all in here. If you weren't here, we were all in here. And we just heard this voice say, wow, it smells so good in here. What are you doing? Or something like that. And we were thinking, I hope she's not in the toilet. Anyway, let's not. Sorry, I'm embarrassing you further. You are, you are awesome, I have to say. You're incredible. I want to get a video of you to show our drummer back home. Can, can you do this? You know, this is just incredible. I love it. 
<laughs> it's true. It's incredible. <laughs> okay, here's the first word. You, you're going to know this straight away. None of this is new. I'm going to ask, are we living it? Jesus said, go. We think churches gather. Jesus said it was go. Now, we're in the middle of a building project, so I am not against building, building projects. Pastor John knows my heart on this. But let's deal with the subtle things of investment into buildings, which we must do. What do you want to do? Meet, you know, in the boiling sun, or in our case, it's snow. My brother texted me yesterday. I woke up to snow today, so I'm glad I'm in South Africa. <laughs> right, okay, so we need, we need buildings. And it's nothing. Money is nothing to God. But the, the subtle danger is the polarity of church can change, usually as we get bigger. Because suddenly as we get bigger and our staff grows and the bills grow and the building grows, suddenly the subtle thing is we must gather to have all of this make sense. And we can actually lose our way. I don't know about you. I, have just, I know I'm preaching to the choir, so work with me on this. Because all the stories of mission, I know you're on this. But I, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing what is already your strength. Never lose your go. Never accept the fearful thing of now we must gather and protect what we've got. That is what begins to kill churches. It kills departments. You were born to go. There's something about, listen, Pastor John, try and empty this building all you can, right? That's what it's all about. I, I love my church most when I'm like, where are they? They're all on mission around the world. I love it. Do you know, I love that you've got an anointing service this morning. We've got a team in Ireland this morning, and they're having an anointing service in Ireland. Wow. Come on. We were called to touch the world. Here's my question to every single person in the room. Have you been on mission yet? I mean, you've got to be really called to stay in the kingdom. And you go, what, he's let you off? He's let you stay in Kempton Park? What kind of a privilege is that? <laughs> well, 95% of us have to go into all the world. You get to go to East Rondmar. What are you kidding? What a, what a great life. Every one of you. Listen, this is what your Christianity should look like. You are on a mission. Every single day. I don't just mean international mission. I mean every day that you wake up and you step out your door, I'm on mission. There's no such thing as full-time ministry unless you mean it's for every single person in this room. We are all in full-time ministry. We are all called to go. The moment the church stops being gung-ho, we start to die. You're supposed to be slightly wild. You're supposed to be slightly crazy. You're supposed to go quicker and further than you should do. You're supposed to want to go further than your staff can cope with. That's where the kingdom lives. You're supposed to do more services, go to more places, plant more churches than you can afford, build buildings that you can't afford. That's where the miracles live. You see, the kingdom is on the edge. The subtle temptation of especially Western modern Christianity is to gather and be cozy. If your church feels like a club instead of a movement, you're in deception. Church should feel like a movement. It shouldn't feel like a gym. Do you, a gym. Do you, join, do you join gyms over here? You join a gym? and you, you join and never go. Anybody do that? Right? And they just nag you. And eventually, I pluck up the courage. I want to leave the gym. Let me leave the gym. Listen, church is not a club that you join. And then you comment on whether you like the carpet or the air con or the lack of air con. <laughs> come on, come on. It's supposed to feel like... It's supposed to feel like Star Wars. Supposed to feel like the Hobbit. We're on. You're a team on an adventure. This isn't a club you come to. Did I like Pastor John's sermon? I'm not sure. Was the music just to my volume? Who gives a fig? We're here to change the world. We're here to explore. Use words like adventure. Everybody say adventure. Has it become an adventure yet? Our master looked into the eyes of our former leaders and said, Go! Yeah. 
And if you go, signs will follow. Subtly around the world, we have leadership conferences on how to gather and how to make the gathering bigger. I couldn't give a monkey. We were born to go, not gather. Now we gather, but only for for one reason, in order to go. Our church is 100 years old, just about. Pentecostal church. When you get anything that's 100 years old, whether it's a husband (laughs) or a church, the spirit of rigor mortis can set in. I sometimes go to this one church. The band is so old. I saw the drummer is like 96, and I'm sitting there going, man, bits are going to fall off that guy if he keeps playing that drum kit, right? Some, some, some it happens as we age. And not because I'm particularly clever, but because of a series of prophetic encounters. We were one location church. We, we were okay. We were good enough to go. We're a decent church. But by a series of prophetic words, we suddenly realized, we actually went through a summer when we shut everything down except for our Sunday service and sought God. Because we knew we needed a new wineskin for the new wine that was coming. See, structure is powerful. If you try to have yesterday's structure with tomorrow's anointing, you'll kill yourself. Or it will kill the anointing. Structures are not divine, they're practical. But understand, they're all chosen. How a staff interact with their leader is a chosen structure. We've had to change us. Up until a couple of years ago, uh, no, sorry, up until about four months ago, I haven't even been leading our largest congregation because I had to spend my time on leadership development. It's a structural decision to release time and energy to do the thing that God wants to do. So several years ago, by a series of prophetic encounters, we sought God and then we thought, you know what? We just need to begin to spread because we're not going enough. I like being gung-ho. I don't know about you. So we planted three new locations in one week. See, I I look out at the congregation. I'm like, what? Come on, come on. How many years are you all going to come and listen to me for? For heaven's sake, when are you going to start doing it? Come on, how dare you? That's not Christianity to come and listen to me. Listen to me until you know enough to start going. So we picked up 30, 40 people here, put them over there, picked up 30, 40 people, put them over there, picked up 30, 40 people. And this non evangelism we're not very good at evangelism. As a pastor, you allowed to say that? Yeah, Yeah, well, I just did. So there, get over it. (laughs) You've got to know what your weaknesses are to know how to overcome them. So I'm going, we're we're a really tidy teaching worship church. But there's something missing. Then by this prophetic word. So we just planted three locations. We took out billboards right across the city and the region. We put 130,000 postcards through doors. We did healing meetings. We gave out hot dogs. We did everything that you could think. And in one year, these little three locations saw 300 people saved. When you pick up an aging congregation and go, right, hang on, whoa, 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 the spirit of rigor mortis and religion is settling in. Give us one more sermon, pastor. We'll grade you out of ten. Go! You see, we, we sit around thinking what we're not instead of going and finding out who he is. That God can use all of you in this room to see people save miracles, signs, wonders. Some of you are great cooks. Divine gifted by heaven. To cook the most amazing braai in the world. <laughs> Hallelujah. I don't care how you do it, but as an individual, as a team... I don't, I don't even care if you're cleaning the loos. Do you say loos? You know what loos are, they? Or John's. <laughs> Who's Jane? Anyway, let's not go there. John. Every single corner of a church must say go, 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 go. That's the culture he gave us. He gave us a method as well as a, he gave us a behavior. Go, don't stop going, don't settle. Dust settles. What are you made of? 
lift us so your most natural inclination is always, just, come on, Pastor John, will you calm down? I look at people in my church and I wonder, we've we got all the time in heaven to calm down. We've got stuff to do here on earth. I mean, if you need a little bit of health and restoration, get to a spa for two weeks, then come back. We've got some going to do. Go. We're going to stretch beyond our capacity. And when all the gaps begin to happen, we go, oh, my word, how are we going to do this? That's when God starts to turn up. He lives in the edges. Listen, there's some enemies to your go. Number one, caution. We haven't got the staff. Oh, come on. Let's, let's begin to step into the miraculous. Now, there's a right pace to have. You can overstretch and be silly. But the church was designed for going. And the miraculous turns up in the go. Another one. Oh, you're not going to like this. Age. See, the problem, I've been in ministry 30 years. My greatest danger is I know how to do ministry. See, something happens biologically, psychologically in you as you age. When you start out in life, you live out of imagination. Zach is nine. I mean, he's going to be an Olympian, an astronaut, anything. You know what I mean? When I was five, I wanted to be a waitress. In other words, you could be anything. <laughs> Let's not go into that sermon, shall we? The days are dark. Right. When you're born, you live out of imagination and you run towards it. Something subtly happens as you age. You begin to develop a thing called memory. And eventually, there's a swap from different sides of your brain. You go from living out of imagination to living out of memory. Here's the danger. At some point in life, you, you actually stop living new things. And instead of living for 20 years, you live the same year 20 times. Very few churches could do what I just said earlier. We shut down everything except for a Sunday service and sought God on what to do next. Why? Because we live out of memory and not imagination. And we build cultures that we think are holy, and they're not. They're just the practical banks of how we get the river to flow. But do not call something holy that to God is neither holy nor unholy. It's just practical. It's behavioral, but affects how we live. So as we get older, we have to push to live in our prophetic imagination again. I mean, if, if my mind and my heart was a clean slate, God, what would you do? I love the question with our senior leadership team. We sometimes ask, if we could do any, forget everything we do. If we could do anything with the money we've got and the people we've got and the God we've got right now, what would we do if we were starting again? Wow. Growing older is a danger to us. Another one, we get too busy. We get so busy we can't change. And of course, to us, everything becomes important. My brother is a little bit of a leadership guru, so he will, he will train football teams, premiership team football teams. He'll train the partners of Sony down in Cape Town. He'll train um, the board of Coca-Cola in Marrakesh. He's a leadership guru. He, he leads stuff around the world in various settings. And he says to me, the hardest thing I ever lead is my cell group at church. I said, why? He said, because Christians lie like no one else does. <laughs> and you can never have a healthy culture built on lies. You will never find a more passive-aggressive group of people than a bunch of Christians because we think we're supposed to be nice and we're never allowed to say, I think we should stop this. I don't think it's doing what we set out to do. It isn't working. And so we passively, you know, make our way around the flower rotor so not to offend Aunt Olga, whatever her name is. You know, and we, we, we desperately try not to close this down or touch that. I remember one day, a department in our church, they said to me, if you touch this department, we are leaving the church. I said, now I've got to touch that department. What are you doing to me? See, we lie and we grow in unhealthy cultures. What did he mean? So he'd sit in his cell group and they'd, they'd agree. So guys, we're going to do this for the next season and we're going to do that. And everybody around the room would nod, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Then they'd all go into the corridor on the way. I didn't agree with it. Did you agree? I'm not sure. Because anyway. we're not very good at being honest, let's be honest, right? Oh, would you like to be involved in such and such? Christians lie. I'll pray about it. Yeah. You little liar. <laughs> you knew straight away. 
And you will never have a healthy culture built on the lies of politeness. Trust me, I come from England. (laughs) We've got to start getting robust, kind, but truthful. Healthy cultures are always kind, but truthful. This is not doing what we expected. And so we can change and adjust cultures as we go along. I'll go along. I'll come back to that in a minute. Oh, I won't do that one. So the first one is go. Everybody say go. Go. Come on. Never, ever lose your go. Oh, another one. Religiousness stops us from going. We lose our spirit of innovation because we become religious. There was a a famous pop star who was thrown out of an Assemblies of God church years ago. He became one of the most famous stars in the world. He was a man of God, anointed by God. When one of his backing singers was ill with cancer, he laid hands on her and she was healed. He would gather well-known Hollywood stars around the piano and they'd sing, There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know it is the presence of the Lord. And they'd weep in the presence of God. He, he moved in words of knowledge. They, they were gathered around in a circle once, and this one guy was like, oh, I've got to ask this guy about heaven in a minute. He said, no, no, hang on, we'll get back to heaven in a minute. He just thought it, and the guy got a word of knowledge. Elvis Presley. We lose our ability to innovate because we think everybody's got to look like us. We think every pop star has got to behave like a Christian in a church. The reality is most great pop stars can't even go to church. That's why they, most of them look like they need a, do you do Alpha course over here? Do you know Alpha course? They need a beginner's course in Christianity. Why? They can't get to church. I remember going around Parliament in the United Kingdom with an MP, and we're talking about Christian MPs, and we talked about a very famous Christian uh, member of Parliament, politician in Great Britain. He came in, he, he said he came in a Christian man with so much great aspirations, and he has had it beaten out of him. I said, why? Is, is it the politicians? He said, no, no, no. It's the church. Because the church doesn't know how to go into politics and go into celebrity, into celebrity culture. Our religious spirit wants everybody to look like us. Otherwise, we protest. That's why we're called protestants. Because we pick over the minutiae of truth. Some of you will not like something I say this weekend and then dislike me because our theology doesn't agree. But let me tell you, I'm not like that. I love the church. I can't help myself. I'm in love with you. I think you're awesome. I don't care if we disagree. We're family. I don't care if we have a fight. We're family. I like you before you even know me. Why? Because that's the spirit of Christ. But that means I can take hold of someone unusual, radical, strange. And go, right, how is God using this to go? I refuse to allow a religious spirit to stop the going of the kingdom of God because I think everybody has to look like me. We need to grow up. We're about to transform the world with the glory of God they are not going to look like us on Sunday morning they're not going to tweet like you they're not going to talk like you they're not going to dress like you thank heavens hallelujah praise God I love it we're going to get to heaven and go what on earth are you doing here (laughs) our religious spirit stops us going amen are you with me Come on, iPad, work. The second word out of the Great Commission, disciple. Everybody say disciple. disciple. Jesus said, make disciples. And in fact, they were called disciples. Jesus said, make disciples. We run church services. He didn't say, go into all the world and run church services. He said, go into all the world, be a training school. Be a barracks. Be a learning environment. We are not supposed to be running. I know churches that spend all of their energy on their Sunday service. And I get it. It's a gathering point. But we can actually lose the point. I know pastors that, you know, have a bad Monday when the numbers are down on a Sunday. Because we're obsessed about how many, how many bums were on seats. That's a subtle culture. Jesus didn't say, listen. We're not called to run church services. 
Church should feel like a training center. Should feel like an assault course. Should, should feel like your day. Yeah, it does down here, right? Okay, it does around here. It should feel like a learning environment. I'm being stretched. I'm being pushed. I'm not allowed to be passive. <laughs> Come on, back row people. I'm not allowed to be passive. I love it when the back row slinks to the front row. You know revival is going on. <laughs> Hallelujah. Or maybe they just, you know, they got in. It's so full because we've got revival going on. I have to be at the back. It's supposed to be a training place. See, something happens. When we just run projects and church services, the spirit of a church changes. Because we're looking for people to do things. And that's very different to making disciples. Churches have a lot of wars because we're just trying to get stuff done. I just need Sunday doing. I just need the PA doing. I just need worship doing. And actually, so I haven't got a worship leader, so I, I, oh, there's a devil's brother-in-law. Okay, you'll do. I just need music. <laughs> Let's put Jezebel, Jezebel on the microphone. Come on, it doesn't matter. As long as we've got music, because we just need, we need to do church services. I don't care the content of your character. We just need to do stuff. I need someone to clean. I need someone to paint walls. I need, I need some. please, just Dress okay, and it's oh, don't worry, not safe, don't worry, not yet, doesn't matter, just go for it. Because we lose the very heart of what this is about. It's supposed to be discipleship. But the thing is, when we hand things to people who are not healthy, they serve for all the wrong reasons. Because they're not disciples, they're not sons and daughters, they're doers. See, if you give an announcement up the front, we need such and such, Sunday school, worship team, tech, whatever. We need things doing. You'll get the doers turn up who are trying to find value in life through doing. But every time you try and change that department, you will have a war and they will leave. Why? Because they're worshiping the doing, not Jesus. And this is the very fabric of the culture of what church needs to be. It, this is a discipleship school. This is a team morning when we gather to learn and grow. And all the way through Monday, Friday, Saturday, we're learning and growing. We are disciples. I am a student. If you give something, even just a badge that says steward to someone who isn't a disciple, they're like Gollum. My precious. <laughs> You've given me the flower rota. It is my precious. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> my precious. It's my worship team. It's my tech desk. It's mine. My pulpit. Don't you touch my. <laughs> And when you get accidentally left off the rotor, I can't believe it. <laughs> After all I've done for you, 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 not Jesus, you. So we end up with a church culture with all these departments and pastors lie awake at night thinking, how on earth am I going to ask them to stop doing this? Because you've got a doer, not a son or a disciple. Or it's supposed to be a house full of sons and daughters who would, they are not in love with their role, they're in love with the goal. If you are in love with your role, you are in idolatry. I could give up what I do tomorrow. I even know what I do. Kruger Park. <laughs> Honestly, I don't even particularly like preaching. I do it to serve you. I burned out of needing to travel and preach 15, 20 years ago. I do not need to travel. I do not need a calling card that says man of God on it. Just, God, I just want to help people. That's what we need to be. Are you a disciple or a doer? If you are asked to stop doing what you do, this is always a sign of health. If I know an area is struggling, I'll say, right, you, 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 and you have a sabbatical. What happened? I'm giving you two months off. What they do next will tell me everything about them. 
a disciple would say, oh, thank you. so You love me that much? Wow, thank you. A doer won't turn up for two months and grumble about me to everyone else. They won't come to church. I only come to church and do the kids' work when I'm on the rotor. You're a doer, not a disciple. Putting so much value in the thing that you do. And I get it. We're all looking for approval. We're all looking for significance. It's part of our human heart. But we have to find it in God. This place should feel like a training center. You're walking out with certificates or whatever, the equivalent on this, that, the other. We have eight locations in our church. We run in eight locations. Just so you know the culture of our church, we plan to be in 20 locations by 2020. So we are on a rapid church planting, but we're a multi-site church. So we don't church plant, we plant locations. I'm I'm the senior um, uh, leader of all the locations, so we're a multi-site church rather than one. Now, in order to be on leadership in our church, you have to be in our leadership school. If you leave the school, you're giving up your place of leadership. Because I only want leaders who are learners. I'm not interested in anyone that feels slightly that they've arrived. Why? Because I know I haven't. I've got a big L plate on and I am learning like crazy and I'm learning from them like crazy and they're learning from me like crazy. And this thing only works when we realize we're all learning off each other. We're all growing in God. We're all going, how did that work? Could I have done better? How can we improve this? How can we make the best thing it is? Don't worry, I'll take this and come on, I'll do this bit. You need me to change roles and come over here. That's fine as long as I'm learning while I go. I'm going to keep learning. That is what the culture of church should be. We're not doing, we're learning. We're learning. We're learning. So listen, we don't have leadership teams. We have a leadership school, and they all run the locations. We don't have a worship team. We have a worship academy. As soon as you get in the worship team, you are a student in a school, not a member of a worship team. We don't have kids workers. We have a a school for kids workers. We don't have youth team. We have a school for youth. Why? Because the church is supposed to feel like a training center. We are using, the point of this is, you are precious to me. And my job is to wash your feet in learning experiences until you become awesome. Leadership is not great men wearing capes. Leadership is I go around putting capes on other people. Because that's what he said to do. So I'm going to wash you. I'm going to send you to conferences. I'm going to send you around the world. I'm going to give you training experience. I'm going to give you books to read. What happens next will tell me everything about you. Because I'll ask you in a month, how would you like that book? And if you look embarrassed, no, you're not the kind of learner I need. If you go, you know what? In the third chapter, there was someone that really challenged me. I know, whoa, I'm keeping this guy. He's premiership. Because I'm looking for learners. You see, if, if you're plateauing in life, get out of here. This is where the kingdom lives. My learning curve is steep. I'm doing stuff that makes me scared. That's what church should feel like. Disciples. Make disciples. You get something from that? If Ephesians 4, come on, we know this. I shouldn't have to read it. Go read it. Ephesians 4, about verse 11 onwards. The fivefold ministry is not there to do the work. Pastor John should not do any work. I'll just let that settle for a moment. That's what the Bible, the Word of God says. He exists to train people. And his not-to-do list should be as big, if not bigger, than his to-do list. We exist to train people. Why? In fact, the whole fivefold, there should be a whole group of people that do nothing but train people in a church. We don't do the works of service. We train everyone to do it so the church becomes powerful. Acts chapter 6, they came to the apostles saying, come on, we need some people to wait on tables. Now, many would go, well, that's a good opportunity to show that I'm servant-hearted. And I said, leadership is servants-hearted. It's not that I have to go and wash some dishes to prove that I am. Trust me, if you've been in leadership long enough, you'll know that nobody really wants to do this. If anybody wants to lead a church, you're dumb or new or something, you know, because it's not easy, it's not fun, it's a very unusual, complex place. You, right? You, you, you go to a doctor, you don't expect the doctor to become your friend, but everyone expects the pastor to become their friend, right? You go to a school teacher, you're going to learn, but you don't then say, yeah, but you have to kind of live with my family and pastor. You know, church is the only place where you fire someone and then say, now, how can I pastor you through that? It's not that it's hard, it's impossible, and it's complex. And the apostles turned around and said, listen, it would not be right for us to wait on tables. We will give our time to prayer and the ministry of the word. And if you read the context, ultimately they're saying this, prayer, the ministry of the word, and delegation. 
If you want an on-fire church, you have to release yourself to have an on-fire pastor. That's why my church said to me last year, take two months off, go and pray. What's the sabbatical policy in the church? I'm just being naughty on purpose. Because if we want to, listen, I want to do this for another 40 years. And I want to do it on fire, not wrung out. Come on. I'm not going to keep the same position, but I'm, going to, I'm not going to retire. I've got too much fire in my bones to retire. Right? But there comes a point as the church grows and we have to release people into discipleship. Then the last one, I'll do this one quickly. The last word. So number one, go, not gather. Number two, make disciples. Don't run church services. Stop thinking we've got to run good church services. Just build big people and the church will run itself. If we go after big church, you end up exhausted. But if you just build big people and say, okay, God, take care of the results. Let's be honest, half the ones you build will disappear anyway and go off on mission and do great stuff. That's kingdom. But God will always leave you enough to build something incredible. Just make big people. The last one. The word baptize. Everybody say baptize. baptize. Jesus, listen, this kingdom only comes by full immersion. You cannot dabble your way into the kingdom. You get immersed. Come on. I don't know about you, but when we baptize people in water in our place, sometimes I just want to hold some people under a bit longer. <laughs> I'll hold them till the bubbles stop. <laughs> then I'll bring them up. Have you changed? <laughs> Jesus. How you doing down there? But you know, we're supposed to, bat. immersion is how the kingdom works. So, you, as a church, for, for example, you were a church immersed in prophetic culture. What, what the leadership here have done is evidently they've taken hold of you and held you under till the bubble stopped. Yeah. Are you prophetic yet? <laughs> Values. It should have about three or four that God has called this place to be awesome at. And then you immerse it until incredible stuff happens. And if somebody's here that wants other cultural values, they should probably be in another church. But there's a place that this place was made to be incredible at, unique at, one of a kind at. And you immerse in that and you preach it and you live it until it becomes an incredible, powerful part of church life. But we can only find the kingdom by full immersion. When I was seven years old, six, seven, my parents were called to the mission field. And um, they argued with God for a few years before that. But eventually, I remember my mum coming to us with pillowcases. And she gave me and my brother a pillowcase each. She said, we're going to go and live in a foreign country because God's told us to. Uh, so you can't take all your toys. You can bring whatever toys you can fit in the pillowcases. We're going to go and live in another country. So me and my brother, we filled our pillow, we filled those pillowcases. <laughs> and then I remember the day so, so clearly. See, this is what the will of God feels like. Th there was a day we, we, we opened our house, we put um, uh, tickets, prices on every single thing in the house, told all our neighbors and our church friends, opened up the doors one day, and neighbors and friends just came and bought everything, cleared the house. And then we put everything we owned into a Citroen 2CV6. Do you know what one of them is? 600 cc, about 68 miles an hour. It's a little bubble. It's a little French bubble car. Everything we owned was put into that French bubble car, and we drove. And as we left our home, my dad, they, they owned their house. He had a great job. They, they were in a good place in life. I was seven. My brother must have been coming up to about 10. And as they drove off, my most vivid memory of the will of God is the sobbing of my mother. I don't mean a little tear down the cheek. I mean guttural sobs of pain that we were leaving everything that we had. That's what God's will feels like. Welcome to the kingdom. He's not come to make you better. He's come to kill you. Until you lose your soul, you'll never find it. Until you open up your wallet, he won't open his. But as we open up our hearts, now I know what, 20, 30, 32 years on more. Oh, let's not go there. Okay, however, it's 40 years on, I now know that my parents have been so blessed by driving off homeless and jobless into another nation. 
They are so set up financially in life that they would not believe. They didn't have a pension until about 10 years before he retired. And they are so blessed. What happened? There was at some point when there was a marker in the ground. And what did it sound like? It wasn't rejoicing. It was going out in tears and sorrow. And I'm giving up. And I'm giving up stuff I love. And this is painful. It's an immersion of suffering. But there is no glory without suffering. We cannot take suffering out of the church. You are going to suffer. I don't mean God's going to make you sick. That's not suffering. But you are going to go through pain and difficulty and giving things up. And it might be. It's probably going to be the one thing that hurts you most. Rich young ruler. Okay. Sell everything then you got and you're going to get immersed in kingdom like whoa God's going to touch the things that are idolatrous in our hearts but why always to bless us and to bring us to glory and to bring us to power in the presence and the might of God's kingdom when we suffer it's unlocking gates we are going to wrestle with the high call some of you in this room are wrestling with the high call God this isn't nice God's in heaven going I know But trust me, when you've been up here 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, you'll have no less days to sing my praise than when you first begun. Do you know what? You're going to realize it was all good, and I was looking after you. I might not always be fair, but I'm just. Okay, I'm just. I'm just. I'll never be in debt to you. I will bless you. And if you give up homes, I will give you homes in this life. If you give up jobs, I will give you jobs in this life. The kingdom only comes by full immersion. During the Second World War, It was the safe pilots that died first. The gung-ho ones all lived longer. I remember some years ago being being invited to uh, be on a sailing yacht around the Greek islands. There's a group of ministers and we were on this trip sailing. My background is in boats, so I love being out on boats. And we were sailing around the Greek islands and we were staying in these little coves. And one night... Um, the skipper, the captain, who looked like D'Artagnan from the Three Musketeers. He, he got us together. The cove we come to was full of other boats. He said, we can't stay here. I know. It's evening. It's getting dark. It's getting stormy out there. Um, but I know there's a cove about four hours sail away. If we go now, we could get there, but it's going to be rough. Do you want to go? Now, around that table, six or seven men of God, there wasn't only anointing. There was testosterone. <laughs> and we said, come on. Yep, let's go for it. So we sailed out and we headed out into the high seas and it got rougher and rougher. And there was this, there was this big black pastor from London. I tell you, I'd never seen a black guy look so green. He, oh. he, he, eventually, he wedged himself with the toilet and he was just puking up all the way across. I've got an Indian friend, a pastor, and uh, he, I've never seen an Indian look so white. I'm tell, he just lay there. Ah, ah, ah. And slowly, they're all going down to where, the, to where the beds are. And I'm looking at a friend of mine, Simon, and saying, you know, the last place to go in a storm like this is down in the hold. And I'm looking, and it was a, a yacht with three masts up and then one sticking out the front. It's called a bowsprit with a net underneath. It sticks that way, and the others are that way. And I'm looking, and I'm, where should we go? What should we do? Then I see the bowsprit sticking out the front. And I said, Simon, let's tie ourselves to the bowsprit. The thing to do in a dangerous journey is have fun. So we jumped out into the net and the staff on the boat all ran to us with these harnesses and we lashed ourselves to the bowsprit and we were heading out into the high seas. Well, we were laughing and screaming and telling jokes and having fun. Then it got rougher and rougher. Well, then my bum hit the water, pushing it up. Oh, 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 oh Jesus. Oh, mummy. Anybody. For three hours, we screamed, we hollered. We were hypothermic by the end of it. We, we, eventually, we unlashed ourselves and got back onto deck when we stopped. And we looked at each other. That was amazing. Wow. It was incredible. And then slowly, the, 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 the pastor friends from the, in the bed, they, they came up. Oh, oh, oh. Come and ask me in a couple of years. Do, do you remember when you tied yourself to the bowsprit? I'll, I'll immediately go. Oh. That was one of the best days of my life. <laughs> then ask a, southern, a certain other Indian pastor that maybe you'll invite here one day and say, Steve, <laughs> might be, might be listening. Sorry, he knows I tell this story everywhere. You go ask Steve. 
Say, Steve, do you remember the day on the boat when Jared and Simon were on the bed? I, I guarantee a little bit of bile will come up in his throat. <laughs> That was one of the worst days of my life. (laughs) Same journey. Different posture. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. So you're born with a lean in, a go, an immerse. I want to learn. Then life begins to happen. And we lose our lean in, we start to lean back to defend ourselves from life, money, abuse, stuff that goes on, church stuff, home stuff, work stuff. And we start to live in a defensive, survive posture. The kingdom does not come to that posture. When Joshua was going into the promised land, God repeated himself. Well, he repeated himself three times and the people repeated God. That's when you know you've got a culture going on. You have a divine echo in the room. If you want to go in, Joshua, be bold. Tie yourself to the bowsprit. Be strong. Stop looking at the risks. Stop looking at the waves. Start looking at the one who's going to carry you through. Tie yourself to the bowsprit. Go. Never lose your go. Never lose your learning. Never lose your immersing in the will of God. I tell you, you keep going. There's no such thing as unanswered prayer. It doesn't exist. Only abandoned prayer. At some point, we oh, this isn't happening. I'm, I'm going to give up now. You might have been five minutes from victory. That's when it's most intense. I just want to go down into the hold and lie down. And I'm just, I'm just going to puke my way through this journey. Isn't it funny how we're all sat in the same room and some of you are in heaven right now and some of you are in hell? That sermon was so long. That British guy, God, he was weird. So I think I just made you all American, but there you go. Wrong country. He was weird, man. And some are like, I could feel God. Because yeah. right? some, I, I, I get in the hold. I'm just trying to make it through. Thank you for dragging me to church, wife, another day. I'm just going to try and make it through. Without Pastor John picking me out. <laughs> Kingdom only lives here. Kingdom lives here, on the edges. In the dangerous areas where only God can come through. That's where miracles are, isn't it? On the edge. God, give us our lean in back. We're going to pray now. We anoint with oil. I believe we're praying for wisdom for leadership. For revival leadership because that's who you are. There's a restructuring coming to this church. There's a breath of God coming. And there's almost like, Pastor John, I believe you're going to be in the tent of the strategy rooms of heaven. And you're going to begin to see new ways and new ways of being uh, aligned and established. And the whole point is when we're aligned right, there's an effortlessness that comes to the mission. And we keep our go and we keep our discipleship and we keep our immersing in the things of God. And people right across the room keep paying the price for the kingdom to come. I give to you of myself. I'm not going to try and save myself. I'm going to lose my soul in God and gain heaven. Let's pray this morning, every one of us, for an anointing. You know, wisdom isn't only learned, it's received. Joshua had the spirit of wisdom on him because Moses laid hands on him. That's what we're going to do this morning. I pray for a new spirit of wisdom to steward revival right across this church because you're going to explode into the nations of the world. Never stop. Don't stop because a couple of things fail. Don't stop because a couple of things don't work out. There's a go hitting this congregation like never before. Well, I hope tonight God has encouraged you or touched your life in some way. Please leave a comment or email us. We'd love to hear from you if you've been encouraged by these broadcasts. There is a free album waiting for you to download if you sign up to our e-news. And now if you stick around, I'm going to tell you about the tribe, our online learning community. And if you want to come and get involved in that and get connected and stay connected to us in the future, then uh, join our tribe.
Hi, I'm Jared Kiva. I want to tell you about The Tribe. The Tribe is our global online learning community made up of uh, believers, leaders, pastors, influencers, artists, all devoted to growing in God together. We're passionate about the things of the Spirit, growing in prophecy, miracles, signs, wonders. We're, we're passionate about revival and the reformation of society, God doing something that will transform the world around about us. And we're passionate about great leadership, doing things with skill and integrity that, again, will impact the world around about us. There's three tiers to the tribe. The basic level is learn, and that's access to our growing library, over 400 units of video, audio, and e-courses to grow you in your faith and walk with God. There's a private Facebook group, an Instagram group, where you can interact with others and with us in a more live way. Tier two is called lead, and it's our global leadership tribe, where we add a lot more leadership content. As soon as you join, you get four of my books on leadership and how to grow in the area of leadership and every book that we write during your membership you will get for free sent to you as an ebook. And then that tier has its own private Facebook group and Instagram group where you can connect with others that are growing in the same journey. Tier three is an extension of tier two, really. It's called Lead Plus, and it's where you can take your whole team, up to 10 people, and have them join under one membership so you're all learning and growing together. I want to invite you to join us on this journey. Join us in the Facebook group, the Instagram group, where we can interact together and then enjoy the massive amount of teaching on the tribe zone that could absolutely transform your ministry. Isn't it wonderful that we can connect around the world like this now with the power of the internet? Let's use it for good and let's walk together and grow together in the things of God.